Good afternoon, everyone. We are here in the Al Shach Synagogue on Sunday Parashat Re, and we're learning the Holy Torah of Ramosha Al Shach. May he be of blessed memory and a zuchut for all of us. So now we're going to continue the pasuk Chavtet that we left off last time. So now it says the pasuk says as follows, and it will be when Hashem will take you into the land that you're coming. Uh, that you're going to come to conquer and he will give the blessing on the Mount of Gurizim and the curse on the Mount of Eval. So it says, Ramosha lavo el inyana ketuvim nasim lev el milat anochi. So we asked the question already um, earlier in the previous section why it says re'e anochi noten lefnechem. Or, right, or... Um, yeah, probably Anochi would be the opposite of Ani, like the other option would be Ani. Um, another thing is, it says, In Vegam El Inyan Hayot Zemi Pivyid Barach. Why? Um, it's Hashem, he's saying Hashem's giving it, but really the truth is, Hashem didn't give it. The, the Jews actually did it, not Hashem and not Moshe. But how Grizim Harivam be Pi Israel Atzman? So they were the ones, the Jews were the ones to say it. Ki hema amrim baruch asher yakim, avru asher lo yakim. Shumu pi ha-koanim, it was the koanim between, in, in a station between the, the mountains, right? As we know, there was, the Gemara explains, there were six tribes on one mountain, six tribes on another mountain, and the Levites and the koanim were in the middle, and, uh, and they, would, they would say all of the blessings down in the middle. So why are we saying that it's Hashem giving the blessings if it's the Jews giving the blessings? So he says as follows, here he gives a mashal to explain this. So this king or minister or leader of the, of the of his people says the following. Till now I have not given you any good. I have not done anything good for you. How can you say that? He's constantly giving us good. Remember, he's still a mashal, a no. scenario of a king, no, let's call him King George uh, the Seventh, is telling, uh, telling the people, I haven't done anything for you, but I'm still telling you to serve me. I'm not going to actually punish you, because I haven't actually done any good to you, so I also can't punish you if anyone disobeys. So we're going to kind of keep it a little bit neutral. There's no good come from my way, so I'm also not going to give you any, any bad. I'm only going to tell you advice. I'm telling you, you should trust me. I'm giving you this advice. Like, if you serve me now, if you, if you obey my commands, it's, it's going to be worthwhile. It'll pay off. Because I have not yet given you any good yet, I can't punish you until... I actually give you any good, so therefore there will be no punishment either. Va'az, en tzarich lomar, va'az, meaning after I do give you good, eventually when the good, the good comes forward, en tzarich lomar, shira'u'i lo'onish gadol ha'shila yavdani, then, once the king has given good to the people, he's taken care of them, he's given them, you know, he's given each, each guy a house, you know, with the thousand dollars in cash, so now, if someone disobeys the king now, now they deserve punishment because if the king gave you such nice, uh, good things, you should obviously jolly well not disobey him. I don't. I wouldn't even need to tell you after after I have given you all the good. You should yourselves apply a punishment for those who do not who do not listen to the king. So that's the mashal. Saying that there's, there's, there's a stage of the king before he, he's implying punishment, and the, then there's a stage where the king doesn't even himself doesn't even need to, to tell us that he's going to give punishment because the punishment is, is self obvious, and the people themselves should be the one to accept punishment upon themselves after they've received such such kindness. So tuvim, Shamar Moshe. This is the following explanation of the pesukim. anochi Hayom. So here, Hashem is saying, so this is explaining the whole parasha, why the, we start off with, right, if we go into the psukim, the first three psukim are 
introductory concept of Racha and Klala, right? The blessing is if you listen to Hashem, the curse if you don't listen to Hashem. And then that's the end of the parasha, three psukim. Now a new parasha begins, right after the space, the Samach. When you enter the land and you, everyone gets their portion, then give the bracha on how greasy. So Rav Moshe is telling us that there's two, two, two separate things here. It's not like Rashi said that the first three psukim are an introductory concept of the blessings and curses, and then three psukim later we start off talking about when and how they should be given. And then in Parashat Kitavo we actually go on again to explain the details of it, which seems very excessive because there's an introduction, another introduction, and then there's the final commandment of how to do it, and then we actually do it. So it seems to be quite excessive, this whole build-up. That's why Rav Moshe is telling us that the first three psukim is not connected to the actual blessings and curses that were given in Eretz Israel on the mountains. This is the blessings and curses without actual repercussions and reward. Why? Because this is in the desert still, when we haven't yet gone into the Beit, to the Eretz Israel. So this is like we said in the Mashal, before the good has been given, then there's no actual punishment. Yeah, but in the Mashal, the good has always been given. The minute we went out right, so you have been, uh, that, that was your question right at the get-go. Yeah. So it seems to be that the main good is, is receiving the Eretz Yisrael. All in the meantime, it's just been like, uh, you know, to keep us alive. In, it hasn't yet way, been... In the way we, we did receive the punishment, in that we didn't get to go into the Promised Land, our children mm. did. At the, at the end of it all, when all was said and done. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the truth is, there was, there was... Yeah, interesting. I mean, the, obviously, there, there was actually reward and punishment in, in the Midbar. Actually, all the more so, the punishment in the Midbar was, was way faster coming. Yeah, Korach. Yeah, things were instant back then. Yeah. It's like uh, Eliyahu Eliya Navi was, was telling Hashem when the Jews sinned in, in, in the sec first temple. He was like, where's the punishment? I'm waiting for the punishment. Hashem said, the midbar, the punishment came instantly. But it's also, it, it makes a, a mockery of the whole thing of Daim. You know, mm. Hashem. Right, the last one is the... You know, it's all, it would have been enough had you just done that. So I don't know, it's just a very odd mashal to bring. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the first I mean, time I, I hear the Ashraf say something that <laughs> She did disagree with. Right. I mean, the truth is, he's gonna he's gonna address that. I mean, he's not, he's not gonna explain it anymore. But he, he does say that um, coming into the land is the main thing, specifically when it comes to mitzvot, because the mitzvot are very connected to the land. As right. he's gonna explain. So when it comes to listening to Hashem's ratzon, like he he expects that in the land more than more than anywhere else. But let, let's see how he... No, I think the question is a good question. I don't think it gets answered, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly. So let's see. Klomar, Sha'adayin lo avartim et ayarden. Why am I saying that good hasn't been given to you yet? Because you haven't yet crossed the Jordan. Velo yerashtim et ayaret ha'ikarit. You haven't yet received the main reward, the main goodness that I'm planning to give you. Al ken eni machbid. I'm not going to be hard, hard, heavy-handed with you. I'm not going to be strict. I'm putting it, I'm putting it before you as a, as a suggestion, as an advice. Right, but without, without the, the consequences that will be later on. But right now, what I'm just saying is this is how it is. This bracha is not like a normal bracha that usually means a reward a consequence to something that you've done. But here, it's different. Here, here it means that the actual bracha is the, is, the, is the listening, is the opportunity to serve Hashem. Vaklala, and the, the curse also is the normal klala. Kamash ma'alomar, arura shalayakim, that a person who doesn't serve Hashem will receive a punishment in the form of being cursed. Raka bracha pi rusha Listening is the good thing, is the bracha, and curse, curses is the thing of itself. The fact that a person doesn't serve Hashem, is not listening to Hashem, Hashem's ways, that itself is the negative thing without any following consequences. 
why am I giving you this as such a, you know, open-ended, like a like such an open relationship where there's like you, can, you have a free choice, like whatever. There's no no serious commitment. Why isn't it? Why aren't you giving us the the blessings and curses in a more serious, com committed way? That we should actually make a, a vow on it, and it should actually be binding with the consequences of punishment and reward. Now we go on to the next section. That it's going to be when you come into the land, then you're going to give the blessing. As in I won't have to tell you to give the blessings and curses. You yourselves, once you've received the land, you'll be the one doing it. Once you've, you've received all this good from me, then I won't even need to tell you to make the curses and blessings because that will be an obvious thing after we've received such good. The regular concept of bracha and klala, which means a blessing and reward as a result, as a consequence. In the, in the first bracha, the first section, it doesn't say haklala ha bracha. It says, bracha uklala. Here it says haklala. Why? Because haklala means the known bracha and the known klala. What does that mean? It means it's the regular usage of the word, where bracha is actually blessing as a reward and klala is a punishment as a, as a, as a, as a curse. And this is how we read the Pesukim. Shirok Tovim, Re'eh Antonel Fenechem Ayom Shem Shnei Dvarim. Anochi Noten, Velo Atem. Here in this first, um, the first um, talking about Barach Akhtar is Hashem. Which means the Fenechem. The Fenechem means you have choice. It's up to you. I'm putting it in front of you. You can choose. But this, this is only Hayom. Which means now, today, when we haven't yet gone into the land. Shadayin Lo Le'ezav Tchalav Advashe Vete Etchem. In kol ze yesh metziyot bracha klala, still there is the concept of bracha klala. Ach lo kipshutan. Not like you would understand the regular concept of bracha, which means bracha bracha shayakim vaklala arash aloyakim. Bracha bracha yashar tishmu vaklala amlo tishmu. It's a blessing which is uh, not a reward or punishment, rather the thing itself. Ach achar shi vachar shem. Then once you already enter the land, berot chash yitiv hashem yimcha. Once you've received this amount of blessing of good, as lo tiachel. Don't wait until someone else tells you to make the curses and blessings. Which is explaining that there's two different discussions here of blessing and curse. Because the blessings and curses are the regular understanding of blessing and curses. Why does it say et in the, both the words bracha and klala? And we know that et usually means to add something else that isn't mentioned. Then it in the bracha, in the so this was in the first one. Yeah. In the first one it says et only on the bracha, but yeah. here it does say in the second parasha it says et a bracha and et a klala. Yeah. So why? Because here, so here he's explaining that in another way of understanding how the bracha and klala here is different to the one originally, because the first understanding of bracha and klala was that there's no consequence, it's just the thing itself. So here we're saying also, there's the thing itself, and then et, et means another thing besides the mitzvah itself being a blessing, there's actually a consequential type of blessing, which is the blessing that comes as a reward. The sin itself is a curse to be separated from Hashem and bring all, of, all these negative energies. Besides that, there's also a curse that is actually a, a consequence and a punishment. So now we're going to continue talking about the significance of the location of these mountains. So there's five different markers about where this is. So we're going to say as follows. Why did Hashem choose that the receiving of the Torah with this vow and curse should be on these mountains? 
Why not anywhere else in Eretz Yisrael? Or even Beberet Sichon Ve'og? Why not even in the other side of the Jordan? Shugam Hinit Chal Kadosh Vatim, because that also was given over to the to the Jews, uh, um, uh, to Reuven and Gad and half of Menashe. Says the pasuk, Alti Tmala Chefetz. Don't you wonder on Hashem's will that He uh, chose that, chose this location? Ki Haloheima Beever Er Yared. So it's, we don't want to do it on the east bank of the Jordan. We want to do it on the west bank. Shehu begvul kadosh ma'ot. It's in the holy part of the world. Masha'en ke meret sichon ve'og, the east bank is not as holy. V'lo makom achar v'kom ot every year. Then, why don't we do it anywhere else in, on the west side of the Jordan? Yan ki ele achare. What does achare mean? Achare means far in. It's not close to the Jordan, it's far inside. And there's a benefit of being further into the land. As it's towards the west. Right? Rashi explains that Derek Mavashemesh means it's it's further west, where like the path of the sun that, that goes to set in the west. Shehula Umata Mizrach, which is the opposite of the cross from the east, Shinichnasuba, Mora Hayot Nichnas Harbe, Tchumer Israel. And that explains that it was far further west, far away from where they originally entered. Vehem Be'eretz Aknani Asher Barava. It's not from, it's not in the portion of the Canaanites who are in the mountain, rather Barava was in the plains, in the, in the, in the flatlands. The mountainous area is closer to the to the Jordan, but rather we, Hashem wanted us to go further in, west, which is where it becomes um, the Arava flat area. Arava in as the as the Arava is is closer in. So basically, all of these all of these descriptions are the fact that we want to go further deeper into the Holy Land. Further away from the border with Chutzlaretz. Another another point is Gam Hemula Gilgal. There's another benefit of this of this location, which is across from the Gilgal. What's the Gilgal? The Gilgal was where the Beit Hamik, where the Mishkan was for 14 years. She is bechina acheret al yotam mul hamakom she sharta shchina arba'as reishana shel kibush v'chiluk. The first 14 years that was that 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 the Jews were conquering and giving out the land. And therefore, the, the, the straight away when the because the as we said before, he explains in the bottom, as we said before that the blessing and curses were given once they received the land, which was the that that rea- that was supposed to give them the reaction of. Oh, we've received all this good, we should therefore accept upon ourselves Hashem's will. So therefore it was done in the place where the Mishkan was at that time when they first entered the land. So that was across from the Gilgal. Why don't we do it in the Gilgal itself? Why is it across from the Gilgal? We want it to be close to Elone More, which is another area. What was in this area? The first time that Hashem promised to, to, to Avraham that he was going to give the land to the Jewish people was in Elone Moreh. Shenema vayavor Avraham ba'aret ad makom shechem ad Elon Moreh. So that's when Hashem came to him and said, I'm going to give you the land. Okay, so now the question is, what, what all of this has to do with, with, uh, with all of what, what's going on? Why, why do we want this to be in, in these areas? So we're saying that we want the commitment to the Torah and the commitment to the blessings as a reward and the curses as a punishment to keeping the Torah to be close to the place where Hashem promised us the land. What does, what does that have to do with each other? And we, right, we want it to be in the place where Hashem promised the land, and it should be far into the land. She be Eretz Israel. So here, Rav Moshe is going to tell us a very important thing: what it means to live in Eretz Israel, and what is the benefit and the main purpose of life in Eretz Israel. The pasuk continues 
right? Ki atem avrim et What does it mean because you're entering the land? So now this is Rosh asked the question before. What is, well, how is this a follow-on? So he's telling us, the Pasuk says, I'm telling you to do this in this, in this place because why? Because you're entering the land. What does the Pasuk say? You're going to enter the land and you're going to conquer it. Ushmartem la'asot et kol achukim and you're going to keep all of these mitzvot, and I'm giving you these mitzvot to keep. So that's what Moshe is telling us now. You shouldn't think to say the following, the giving of the land as a gift to the Jewish people, and our conquering and, and inheriting it is what for? Is to eat its fruit and to, to, to enjoy its, its goodness. Rak is not the purpose. The kayem atara mitzvot. The purpose of going into Eretz Israel is to keep the Torah and mitzvot. Kisham ikaram. Only in Eretz Israel is the real place to keep mitzvot. Why? Because makom mekudash Eretz Israel is mekudash keneged Eretz aliyona. The, the the real Eretz is in Shemaim. The spiritual land exists in heaven, and Eretz Israel is is uh, parallel and is connected to the spiritual Eretz. And therefore, that's the place where all of the mitzvot are, are ideally, ideally kept. As we know that Rashi brings to us last week's parasha, Rashi says on, on the Vayayim Shamor that we say in, in Shema, it says there that if you serve idols, you'll be, you'll be um, kicked out of the land, you'll be Vavadtem Mehera Mala Aretz, and then it says, with some time at Devara Ela, you should still keep the mitzvot. Where tefillin, learn Torah, keep mezuzah. So Rashi says, why does that say, why is that following on the fact that we were kicked out of Eretz Israel? So Rashi says, even though you're not in Eretz Israel, still keep tefillin, still, still learn Torah, still put a mezuzah in your house. Why? So that when you come back, it shouldn't be strange to you. You should have, uh, have the practice. So that's really crazy, it's a really crazy thing that when a Jew is in Chutzah Eretz, it's all just practice. Like the Ramban brings there that all of the mitzvah and chutz are just tziyunim, Rashi brings. They're just uh, things to remember. But they're not the mitzvah itself. The mitzvah itself only really exists in Eretz Israel. So the whole purpose of giving the Torah was, the whole purpose of giving in the land was to keep the Torah in it. Because this is a place where that's connected to the higher level of, 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 uh, of reality. Mityacheset el Torah Torah And the Eretz Israel is connected to <laughs> the, the, the Eretz that exists on a spiritual level. <laughs> and the, the, lower, the lower worlds connect to the higher worlds in a, in a direct manner. <laughs> One who keeps the Torah outside of Eretz Israel has an indirect connection to the spiritual, the spiritual land. So therefore, the place of doing Torah is here. <laughs> Because the Eretz Israel and Torah are very connected, Ra'ui Shi'ikar Kabbalat Torah, the main con- um, receiving of the Torah with the level of commitment of the reward and punishment should be where? In Eretz Israel. It should be in the place where Hashem told us, gave us the promise. The only purpose is why are you going into the land? So that you should keep the mitzvah. The Lord of Acher. We're not here just to to enjoy the, the beautiful fruits and the security or whatever else it is. We're here to do mitzvot. Oh, yeah, my man, that do. So here we're explaining again why it was it specifically across from the Gilgal. It's a lot more because it was near the place where Hashem promised the land. So this is a very powerful thing where Moshe is telling us that why did we do it next to the place where Hashem promised the land? It's because once Hashem promised the land, you would say, hey, that's it, he promised. There's no way he can renege on his promise. That's it, it's ours forever. So Hashem is telling us, you should make a promise to me to keep the Torah in the same place that I promised to give the land. Because that's, mm. that's an equal promise. It doesn't, go, it doesn't go one with the other, it doesn't work. Ki Kadosh Baruch Hu Zu. Hashem wanted us to vow to him. Ki arur boshvua, a curse, is a form of, of, of vowing, of, of promising. Bema komsha aretz, in the same place, 
Asher nishba Asher metita la Avraham lazar metina mamakom. Should be in the same place that Hashem promised to Abraham. The man is Karuz, they should remember lekayim gam shvatam shem kabli mamakom. Just like Hashem, we find ourselves now in the Holy Land, in the place where Hashem promised us. So the Hashem should be like, ah, you see, I kept my end of the deal. I want you guys to promise to keep your end of the deal. Kasher kiyem huid barach shvotav aretz ashinet namakom ahu. So that we should keep our end of the promise just like he kept his end of the promise. So then we'll continue, or what? Uh, I think I won't do Shira Shirim today. You would? No Shira Shirim today. So we can do another few minutes, or should we? If you don't do Shira Shirim, another 10 minutes. Okay, so then it says a very interesting thing. Um, it says, the Pasuk says, you're crossing the Jordan to enter the land that Hashem is giving to you, not ten lachem, virishtimata, and you will inherit it. So Rav Moshe now is going to focus on the difference between a giving, which means like a matana, which is a gift, and an inheritance. So let's see. Let's see. Hashem asamru, halo amarta, ki kashe yevi en Hashem ala aretz, so you're saying that when Hashem takes, takes me into the land, I'll see how much good Hashem does, does to me, has done to me. As, I'll do my bit, I will therefore, on my own accord, accept upon myself the Torah and mitzvot with this level of commitment of a, of a Shavua. So matana. So, you, so now we have the, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a place for a person to ask and say and, and claim, so what, why, why am I now committing to the Torah from, on my own accord? Because I've received this beautiful gift called the Holy Land of Israel. But that's not really a gift. Hashem promised it to my ancestors, to my, to my forefathers. It's, it's, my, it's my birthright. Mm-hmm. It's my inheritance. So don't, don't come to me and say, well, I've done so much good to you, now you have to be good to me back. All you've done is given me the inheritance that I naturally deserve. Right? So I don't, I don't owe you back anything. What kind of gift is this? It's not a gift. I'm inheriting the inheritance from my, from my forefathers. Just like any man would, would, would inherit his father. So that would mean, I don't need to keep the mitzvot. Don't think that. Don't say that. Ki halo atem ovrim. Etc. So, what's the, how's the pastor going to refute this kind of claim? Rav Moshe is going to bring us a Gemara in Baba Batra. It has an interesting halacha. The halacha is as follows that a person that gives a, a gift to someone has the power to limit the extent of the gift. Meaning, I could say, I want to bequeath to you my estate. But when you die, I want it to go over to someone else. I Meaning it's only yours as long as you're around. Or even before this person dies. But I say, I'll give it to you for 10 years. And when 10 years are over, automatically it goes on to someone else. So the, 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 a gift is, is able to be limited. Whereas an inheritance, once you inherit something to someone else, then there's no stopping that. It, it automatically they become the only the only heir to this thing, and then there's no way of you, um, you know, stopping that, the, the, the inheritance from continuing. So a the, gift, you could say, you can use it for farmland, but I don't want you to uh, drill for oil on it. Mm, right, that's another version of saying, limiting How the... You can use it. Right, interesting. You can use only the produce that comes out of it, but nothing that's going to permanently change right. the structure of it, uh, for instance. Right, so that they kind of, so that's a bit different because there, in a way, you're kind of keeping your ownership regarding that thing. So it's, you haven't really given it away completely. Here, you've given it away completely, just for a limited amount of time. But it also comes from the fact that you're still keeping tabs on it, like you're keeping some kind of uh, attachment. Whereas inheritance, kind of, there's no like because inheritance, in a way, is replacing your ownership by them. So there's no way you could still be involved because it's like instead of you. I like, guess what the concept of inheritance is. So the rabbis say the chalkam they make a difference, a distinction between matana ben Yerushalayim matana, 
כי ירושה אין לה הפסק, inheritance can't be, can't be uh, stopped in any way, whereas uh, מתנה יש לה הפסק. כאן הודעה בגמרא, as is known in the Gemara. For example, he brings, כי אללה נותן לבלתי יורש בלשון מתנה. If somebody gives a gift to someone who's not an inheritor, who's not a natural, um, what's the inheritor? Right, someone who inherits. If he gives it בלשון מתנה, if he gives it with the, uses the term gift, יכול לומר ואחריך לפלוני. He could say, after you, someone else should receive it. מה שאין כן ליורש, when it's an inheritance, there's no, כי ירושה אין לה הפסק. ירושה can't be, can't be stopped. So now, with this principle, we'll understand here this פסוקה. ונעבור אל העניין. אמר אל יעלה רוחכם כי ירושה את אבותיכם אתם יש מרושת עולם. Don't you think that the, the land is yours forever, with no, with no, there's no caveat at all in the, in the inheritance, just like any other inheritance that can't be, that can't be limited. כי הן אמת ידעתי כי אתם עוברים את הירדן. You think that you are entering the land, לבוא לרשת, with the intention of becoming an inheritance that can't be stopped at any point. You should know it's not true. The fact that you entered the land through miracles. Which miracles? They crossed across the Jordan with, by foot. Because the waters of the Jordan moved aside. So now you have the illusion that that's it. Hashem is with you forever. And there's, no, there's nobody who's ever going to be able to take a land away from us. That you can now live in this land with a sense of security that there's no, there's no coming back. There's no, there's no, anyone, nobody can take it away from us. It's going to be an inheritance forever. You should know, says Moshe, it's not like that. Hashem, is, Hashem doesn't have the same intentions as you. Hashem is giving it to you as a gift. And what's the difference between a gift and an inheritance? The Torah Matanash, Yesh Leifsek, a gift can have a caveat, it can have a, 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 a clause in the contract. She'im lo ta'asurat sano, if you will not do Hashem's will in the land, tiyye acharecha uzatcha, then it's going to go on to someone else. Ach tuchlu lo asotah, the only way that you can turn the land into an inheritance, if you, if you do Hashem's will. How can you, yeah, make it into an inheritance that, that nobody can take it away from you? Through doing the mitzvah. This is a beautiful thing. This is how we, how we, read, how we read the Passover. You're coming into the Jordan. You're coming and you think, you think it's forever. You think it's an inheritance that can't be changed. Why do you think that, says Ramosha, is included in the word Atem of Rimeta Yarden? Because when you went through the Jordan, you went through with great miracles. So you've got this illusion that that's it. Hashem's with you all the way, regardless of your actions. But you should know, Asher Hashem alakachem noten lachem. Hashem's giving it to you as a gift, which means that there's a clause in the gift. But I'm going to give you advice, says Moshe, if you want it to be an inheritance forever, if you do want to live in it forever, you should keep all the mitzvot. That's how we could stay in the land forever. That's, that's what we're dealing with right now, when Hashem has brought us back to the land, and, and uh, we need to really be uh, zochet to keep the mitzvot in the land, and that's the only way we can stay here. Hashem should help us uh, do our bit, and everybody should uh, be able to do the shuva, and Hashem should have mercy on us. Let's finish up the piece. So before we spoke about the idea of machshava, that a person has a ratzon, a commitment, a thought to do a mitzvah, Shachadosh Baruch Hu Mitzar for the Masa, Hashem connects it to as if he's done it. You could think that Hashem saying, oh, Hashem, all Hashem wants is, is the thought to do mitzvah. So you should think that, oh, so that's it? The only thing you need to do is think about doing mitzvahs? No. Yalotov tovhu adin ketz 
So you're right that there's a beautiful thing that Hashem accepts the desire to do mitzvot in, if, we are, if we're not able to if we're not able to actually carry out the mitzvah. But obviously, there's no, there's insig- it's, 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 it's no, there's no comparing doing a mitzvah actually as well. So now what I'm saying is, that right now you're not able to do the mitzvot yet. Why did I mention the fact that you, some mitzvot, it's, it's good enough to do mitzvot in thought, because you haven't yet entered the land. And because you haven't yet entered the land, you have, you're not able yet to do the mitzvot. So even though you're not able to do them right now, you should want to do them. You should decide in your hearts to do them. And then, Hashem's going to accept it as a, as a mitzvah. So here we're saying that, well, that even though he's not able, we're not able to do the mitzvot, <coughs> you should accept to do them. And even just the accepting to do the mitzvah, Hashem will already consider it like we've done. Vod shenit, ela chukim, asher, etc. So now that this is the next pasuk that says that you should do mitzvot when you enter the land, which mitzvot? Namely, to destroy all of the idols that exist in the land. So, but that's a mitzvah that we can't do yet before we've entered the land. So on this specific mitzvah as well, she'iyev shalasotam kodem avod yarden. That these mitzvahs are not able to we're not able to do them until we actually enter. Al ken echtis kum mitzvotayim. How we're going to be able to to receive the merit of conquering the land if we can't do the mitzvah that we can't do. Im lo We can do it by deciding to do it, by wanting to do it. If you decide already now to do it, then Hashem will consider it done already. That's why the Rav Moshe is answering the 14th question we had earlier. It says, Ushmartem la'asot. It doesn't say Ushmartem la'asitem. You, you should keep it and, and do it and you've done it so no you should just keep it keep the thought of doing it in the future because if you decide you want to do it Hashem will already consider it done already so Hashem we should conquer the land Mashiach now thank you Hashem